Welcome to Cooking School. On today's show, I'm gonna teach you how to create a classic steakhouse meal right in your own home. Steakhouses originated in New York in the late 19th century. With their red leather banquettes and the dark wood, they had a clubby, exclusive, glamorous feel that enticed everyone. Our steakhouse menu starts with an iconic American cocktail, the martini. Next, the quintessential appetizer, baked stuffed clams with a delicious herb breadcrumb stuffing. And for everyone's favorite entree, the technique for a perfectly cooked porterhouse steak, served with the most delicious creamed spinach. And lastly, the tried and true baked potato garnished with sour cream, bacon, chives, or cheddar. Few meals satisfy like those enjoyed at your favorite steakhouse, which can now be your own kitchen. An icy cold martini is simply divine. It's traditionally made with gin and vermouth, but it can also be made very successfully with vodka, which is my choice. I like to have garnishes for my martinis, some wonderful stuffed olives, pickled onions. For those who like dirty martinis, save the onion juice or the juice in which the olives are pickled. In my martini, I like just a nice piece of lemon peel which you can twist into the drink. It tastes very good. I have some toothpicks for your olives or your onions, and these conical shaped glasses, the traditional martini glass. It's really nice to have those on hand. You also need a martini shaker. It comes apart into three pieces. This is the bottom, this is the top, with a little strainer inside, and this is the cap. You should all have one of these in your bar or your liquor cabinet. And some ice. These small ice cubes are very nice for martinis. Put a few scoops of ice in your shaker. And make sure there's no water. You do not want a diluted martini, for heaven's sake. One cup of vodka or gin. And as I said, I prefer vodka and use really good vodka. And if you're having guests who you know love martinis, get their favorite liquor. And one tablespoon of vermouth. If you want a really, really dry martini, it's like this. That's dry. Slightly less dry, about a teaspoon. And regular, it's about a tablespoon. That's it. And remember, James Bond's martinis were always shaken, not stirred. You can do the Tom Cruise over the shoulder bartender shake and shake it until the outside of the shaker is covered with a film, an icy film. Then you know that your vodka is really chilled. My fingers are frozen, must be ready. So just take off the top and pour into clean, cold glasses. And a good martini should come close to the top, but not so it spills. These must be served immediately. Now, my piece of lemon for mine, you twist, and if you can catch the little bit of oil that falls from the skin, that's fantastic. And I think my friend wants olives. So put one, two, or even three olives on a decorative toothpick and place it right in the drink. Whichever way you prefer, vodka or gin, shaken or stirred, a martini will always be a classic. Baked stuffed clams, so delicious. They came out of the shellfish fat of the early 20th century, when just about every restaurant had a baked shellfish recipe on the menu. While there are variations on the filling ingredients of this steakhouse favorite, one thing remains the same. The clams need to be well scrubbed and removed from their shells. And these are called top neck clams, somewhere between a little neck and a cherry stone. Notice they're just about the size of my palm. Perfect size for stuffing. You can also do the great big quahogs if you have them. In a big pan, add two tablespoons of olive oil and one small red onion. 
has been peeled and chopped. We're going to steam the clams so that they steam open without overcooking the clams. And with the red onion, about oh, four or five cloves of garlic peeled. So as soon as that's cooked just a little tiny bit, we're gonna add our clams. So we'll put these in, and I have them on ice. Very important once you bring these home to keep them icy, icy cold without freezing them. And they are scrubbed, they are clean. If they have any vestiges of sand, you can also soak them in a bucket of icy water for an hour or two. And one cup of dry white wine. It can be the leftover wine from last night, but it should be a good wine. Cover. Let them steam. It's going to take about eight minutes for these top necks and anywhere between five and six minutes for little necks or, or cherry stones. So now it's time to start the stuffing. This is two cloves of garlic, finely minced, and a half of a white onion, and just two tablespoons of olive oil. Cook that until it's translucent. And now let's check the clams. It's been just about eight minutes. Oh, they are opened. Now remove the clams to a tray. Oh, look how beautiful that is. That is a plump and gorgeous clam. Now, if a clam has not opened perchance, leave it, throw it away, discard it. Now, this beautiful liquid, um, which is full of little bits and pieces, strain, and you will be using a little bit of that liquid. So now the stuffing itself. Four tablespoons of butter. This is room temperature butter, nice and soft. And we want to stir it up in the big bowl and add fresh breadcrumbs. This is a cup of fresh breadcrumbs. And let's stir this around. And almond flour, a half a cup of almond flour. This is a surprising ingredient, but it tastes really good. Now, if you can't find almond flour, you could use blanched almonds and grind them up really, really fine in the food processor. And there are herbs. A tablespoon of dill, a half a teaspoon of dried rosemary, and one teaspoon of thyme leaves. And look, half a cup of finely chopped parsley leaves. And add some salt and pepper. So now, Try to remove all the clams from the shells. You can use a little clam knife if you have one. Take your knife and just release it. If there is a little muscle left in the shell, scrape that right out. Now, reserve eight of these beautiful clams for stuffing. That's 16 halves. So now the onion mixture is ready to put into the stuffing. Stir that in. So that's the base for the stuffing, and now we have to chop up the clams. Save this juice. This is all nectar of the clam. So good. And now break each clam in half. Twist if you have to. But if there's a little broken piece of clam like this, make sure you discard it. You don't want that. So now the shells are ready. We're gonna chop the clams, and you want a rough chop, you don't want it too fine. Get them into, oh, like half inch pieces is good enough. We're not gonna mix this into the stuffing, we're gonna put these in the shells and then top with the stuffing mixture. This way you're going to have real pieces of clams. So each shell will get at least a whole clam back into it, but now chopped. Some people don't even take the clam out, they just put the topping on the whole clam in the shell. Uh, you can do that, but it's a little harder to eat. You are going to love this recipe. Let's see, one last little bit. That one could use it. So here you have your 16 clam halves, and we're ready to put the stuffing topping on. But it is a little tiny bit dry, so you're gonna add maybe four, five, six tablespoons of the 
clam steaming liquid just holds it together. Looks good. So use a spoon and best way I think is right over the bowls in case it falls. So scrape it like that. Idea is to cover the clams with the beautiful filling. Perfect stuffed clam. Now the oven is preheated to 350 degrees. Get these right into the oven and bake for, oh, approximately 25 minutes. Here they are. They look so good. And I just happened to find at the fishmonger some beautiful seaweed. The clams can be placed right on the seaweed. You can serve these with wedges of fresh lemon. A little cocktail fork would be great, or a little salad fork. Very nice. So there, doesn't that look great? Once you taste these, you're going to say they're the best baked stuffed clams you've ever tasted. And they certainly are one of my all-time favorite appetizers. Enjoy. So now for the best part of the meal, the steak itself. In the early 19th century, porterhouses provided a place for coaches to stop so travelers could dine. At one such establishment in New York City, a special cut of steak was served that later became known as a porterhouse, offering the best of both worlds. This cut has the flavorful strip steak on one side and the tenderloin on the other. You can see it right here. This is the tenderloin and this is the strip, but the bone is intact. We're going to serve this steak with a compound butter, and we're using a half a pound or two sticks of room temperature unsalted butter. And to that butter, we're adding about two teaspoons of chopped chives. Just add those right in. I love how that looks. And about a tablespoon of parsley and about two teaspoons of thyme. And you stir this up. I always put a little bit of pepper in my butter and a little bit of salt. By using unsalted butter, you control the saltiness. Now, this can be made way in advance and put right in the freezer. This butter is delectable, melted into the cooked meat. And form this into a cylinder in the parchment, roll it up. As it gets cold, it'll hold its shape. And then you can twist the ends and tie them. Put this in a plastic bag, and it can sit in the freezer for a few weeks. So now the steak itself. A porterhouse is the same cut as a T-bone, but from farther back on the animal so that it contains more tenderloin, this part right here. And this is a gorgeous piece of meat. I love this steak, and it's very well marbled. Rub the outside with salt and pepper, both sides. Have your cast iron searing skillet heating right beside you. Dry the meat well with a, a paper towel if you find it moist. This is pretty well dried, so it will not brown as nicely or sear as nicely if you try to cook it wet. So. This is basically ready to go. If you hear a great sizzle, you know that you're caramelizing the outside of the steak. Yes, perfect. The reason for the high heat under this pan is to make a crust on the outside of the meat. Now, if the meat were not as well marbled as it is, I would have added a little bit of oil to the pan just to prevent any sticking. Searing really does help adhere the seasonings, the salt and pepper, to the meat four minutes per side. Be sure to wait until the steaks release easily from the pan before turning the steaks. Ah, now that is a really good sear. And this is where the cast iron skillet really comes in handy. It is doing its job. Make sure your oven, by the way, is preheated to 425 degrees. This steak is going to go right into the oven for about 10 to 12 minutes. For medium rare, remove the steak from the oven uh, when it reaches 120 degrees, since the internal temperature of the steak will rise 
about seven to 10 degrees after you've taken it out of the oven. So be very careful. It's been 12 minutes. The steak looks incredible. Don't you think? Now it's important to remove the steak from the pan onto a cutting board like this and it has to rest for about 10 minutes. Resting the steak equalizes the internal temperature of the meat and the juices are reabsorbed into the meat, not in this little moat around the board. So 10 minutes, don't rush it. So one two pound porterhouse will yield quite a bit of meat. I would say that this steak would serve generously three people cut the meat across the grain. Mm -hmm. So utterly beautiful. And this meat can be arrayed on the platter. And this is the tender tenderloin. You can put some beautiful vegetables on this platter or you can serve the meat as is. But this is the compound butter. That is a really great looking porterhouse steak. All you need is a really good glass of your favorite Cabernet, and you have an unforgettable meal. Enjoy. One side dish always on our table, especially around the holidays, was my mother's cream spinach. And I'm gonna share her recipe with you today. Look at this amazing spinach. Look at the size of the leaves. This is what you look for, really beautiful bright green leaves. Very important to wash the leaves and shake out the excess moisture. This is two and a half pounds of spinach. So just put this right into your deep pot and uh, you can turn this up to hmm, sort of medium. So spinach is very high in vitamin C, E, and K, as well as beta carotene, folates, riboflavins, and other antioxidants. It should be fresh, crisp. So there, that's two and a half pounds. See how it compacts itself right down into there? You can cover it. So now, where did the spinach go? It's right here. You can take them out. See how wet they are? Really wet. You can squeeze out extra moisture with the tongs. But if you made the cream spinach with this wet spinach, it would be too watery. Secret is to make it a little bit drier. There. So, two methods. One result, drier spinach. So put a little bit in here. This is called a ricer, and it works very well. Just be real careful if the spinach is really hot, not to press too hard, but you have to pour out the top as well as the bottom. So that's one way. Now the other way, and the way my mom did it, was in that damp towel. You squeeze it out. It takes a little bit more work, but it's effective. There. So we now have our semi-dry cooked spinach and we will make our bechamel. The butter has melted. That's three tablespoons of butter, a quarter of a cup of flour. And stir that around. So cream spinach really doesn't have cream in it unless you add cream, but it's a bechamel, which is a flour-based milky sauce. And now add one cup of milk. And I'm making it right in this shallow pan, which is a nice way to cook it because you're gonna add the spinach right to the pan. Add one teaspoon of sugar. A secret ingredient. Oftentimes, southern cooked vegetables taste so good, and it's generally because they add a little tiny bit of sugar to the vegetables. So there, that's your very nice bechamel and a little bit of nutmeg. You can use the pre-ground nutmeg out of a can, but it's so much better if you use a real nutmeg. So there, that is your bechamel. Turn that on low, low and chop your spinach. Two and a half pounds. 
Use a sharp, sharp knife or cleaver. And you want a fine texture, but don't put it in a food processor. I think it will only mush it. So this can go right into your pan. It's such a great color. Mm. That is good creamed spinach. Season with salt and pepper. Beautiful, so good. And spoon that into your serving dish and serve it hot. And my mom, well actually, she always served it with a little bit of sour cream on the side. I hope you enjoyed this recipe as much as my whole family did. Steakhouse style baked potatoes, known for their crispy skins and soft fluffy interiors, beckon to be garnished with your favorite toppings. But the trick is to start with the right potato. I always look for a potato with firm texture without any soft areas, with a nice unblemished skin and a nice heft to it. Avoid sprouting eyes, slits, or a green tinge. That's an older potato. It's been out of the ground too long. Avoid buying potatoes in bags. It's much better to select them one by one. And if you live in a place like Maine or Idaho, try to buy the potatoes as they come out of the ground. Those Maine potatoes are so delicious, as are the really big, beautiful Idaho's. Store your potatoes in a dark place at room temperature until you're ready to use them. Wash the potatoes, these are nice and clean. I like to bake them right on a piece of parchment paper, baking sheet like this, not touching, and I put them right into a 400 degree oven for about an hour until they are tender to the point of a knife. They're really rich in vitamin C when eaten with the skin, and a medium potato can provide you with nearly half the daily adult requirements of vitamin C. I like to offer toppings for my potatoes, even though I eat mine just with a little bit of butter and sour cream or creme fraiche, and lots of salt and pepper. Crispy bacon, you can just cut it into uh, like pieces once it's cooked. I like to cook it first and then crumble it. Uh, we have chopped chives, you might like that. And cheddar cheese is a favorite, white cheddar especially good. There, now we have to wait for the potatoes. So these have been in a little bit more than an hour. Ah, lovely, the knife goes right through. Now, while they're still very, very hot, you can pick them up with a towel or if you have kind of iron hands, take them like this and hit them like that. This fluffs up the interior and really makes the potatoes very, very delectable. Otherwise, you're gonna get those potatoes that are really dense inside. There, that one worked beautifully. See how fluffy that is? All the fibers are broken up. <laughs> it's kind of fun, too. That is the secret to a really good baked potato. They're almost mashed when you do that. And they're ready to serve. No matter what topping you choose, these potatoes will be delicious. Thanks so much for watching, and please tune into the next episode of Cooking School. Preheat two baking sheets in a 450 degree oven. Peel four potatoes and cut into quarter inch sticks. Toss in a bowl with two teaspoons of olive oil, coarse salt, and pepper. Remove baking sheet from the oven and spray with non-stick cooking spray. Divide potatoes between hot baking sheets in a single layer. Bake, tossing occasionally until golden brown, 20 to 30 minutes. Serve with your favorite condiments.